This is the first in what's planned to be a series of YouTube videos on the Heathkit H89 computer. In this video, I'll talk about the history of the computer and the Heathkit computers that preceded and followed it. Future videos will cover hardware and software in more detail, as well as restoration of this unit and some recent developments by hobbyists for the machine. As early as the mid-1950s, Heathkit offered several models of analog computers. Using vacuum tubes, these were not truly programmable and had very limited capabilities, and were mostly offered for the educational market and for some specialized engineering uses. The development of the transistor, followed by the integrated circuit and microprocessor, made programmable digital computers practical. Thanks to Moore's law, the cost of microprocessors and other electronic components, such as memory, continued to come down to the point where a digital computer became affordable for early adopter hobbyists. In 1974, a small company called MITS introduced the Intel 8080-based Altar 8800 computer kit. Despite being limited in features, the user interface was a front panel with binary LEDs and toggle switches, and only 256 bytes of memory were included in the base unit, and relatively expensive, $439 in 1974, equivalent to almost $2,000 today. It was a runaway success with thousands of orders in the first month. Based on the success of the Altair, a number of companies got into the market, offering systems that were compatible. The Altair used a design with a backplane and card cage supporting expansion boards that used a 100-pin edge connector that became a de facto standard known as the S100 bus. Most Altair-compatible systems used the S100 bus, and a number of manufacturers started offering boards for this market, such as memory, input-output, and floppy disk controllers. The other area of standardization around these Intel 8080 and later Zilog Z80 S100 systems was use of the floppy disk-based CPM operating system. The introduction of CPM added file storage, printing, and a large selection of compatible software applications that dramatically improved the capabilities of these early microcomputers, making them useful tools for hobbyists and businesses. By the end of the 1970s, prices would come down even further with the introduction of microcomputers from companies such as Apple, Commodore, and Radio Shack. The hobbyist market for computers would expand at an even greater rate, although in some ways it was a step backwards from the days of S100 and CPM, as the new microcomputers were largely incompatible with each other, something that would later change with the introduction of the IBM personal computer and its compatibles. No doubt inspired by the success of the Altair and similar systems, Heathkit decided to enter the microcomputer market, introducing the H8 in 1977, selling as a kit at a price of $379. The system consisted of a main unit with a cabinet containing a power supply, front panel, and expansion card slots. It utilized an Intel 8080A CPU running at 2 MHz. A 16-key front panel with eight seven-segment red LEDs and four discrete LEDs could display addresses and registers and allow the system to be programmed in octal. This was easier to use than systems like the Altair that had binary switches. The LEDs displayed continuously while programs were executing, and a monitor program in ROM could load and dump programs via paper tape, a serial port, or cassette tape, without requiring having to enter a bootloader program by hand on each power-up. The card cage accepted up to nine cards. It used a backplane with a 50-pin buffered bus, similar to but not compatible with the S100 bus. The lack of compatibility with S100 boards was a notable design decision. Heathkit claimed that it was done to improve on some of the design flaws of the S100 bus, but it was also a way to lock users into buying their peripheral cards. The cabinet included a built-in convection-cooled, i.e. fanless, power supply, and a speaker that could produce a beep. While it came with a fully wired and tested CPU card, the system was offered as a kit and the user had to assemble the power supply and front panel circuit boards, internal wiring, and mechanical components of the case. It was estimated to take six evenings to assemble. Initially selling for $379.95, the basic system needed some additional accessories to run, at minimum at least one memory board with 4K of RAM. The board came with 4K but could be expanded to 8K by adding 8 more memory ICs bought from Heath or off the shelf, 
and you could install up to four memory cards subject to the number of free slots. Serial I.O. and cassette tape storage required an additional serial I.O. and cassette interface board. Also offered was a parallel interface card that allowed the H8 to connect to a paper tape reader or to a parallel printer. Typically, the system was controlled using a serial terminal like the Heathkit H9 video terminal or H36 Deck Writer 2 printing terminal that Heath offered. Cassette storage ran at 1200 baud and could use any tape deck, although Heathkit only guaranteed proper operation with their unit. The software included with the machine on cassette tape or punched paper tape included Benton Harbor Basic, Heathkit's version of the popular basic programming language, an assembler for AD80 assembly language, a text editor for editing of assembly language source code, basic programs, and text files, and a console debugger that allowed entering and debugging programs from an external terminal and supporting such features as single step, breakpoints, and loading and saving to tape. Using an H8 with cassette tape or paper tape was slow and tedious. You had to first spend several minutes loading the application, such as BASIC, and then load your BASIC program from tape. In 1978, the H17 5.25 inch floppy drive was introduced. The disk format was 40 tracks, 10 sectors per track, hard sectored, and provided 102 kilobytes of storage on each 5.25 inch disk. The floppy drive is supported by the Heath written HDOS operating system as well as CPM. In the 1970s, there was a distinction between microcomputers, which used microprocessors and were primarily used by hobbyists and small businesses, and mini computers, which were larger, more powerful, more expensive, and mostly used by medium to large businesses. At the time that the H8 was introduced, Heathkit also offered the H11, which is essentially a DEC PDP-11 16-bit mini-computer sold in partial kit form. While similar in appearance to the H8, it used an LSI-11 processor, QBus architecture for expansion, and ran a simplified version of DEC's RT-11 operating system called HT-11. It was not particularly popular, primarily because it was too expensive for most Heathkit customers, and was discontinued in 1982. The H8 required a serial terminal if the user wanted to program it using more than the front panel, and the Heathkit H9 video terminal offered for the H8 was quite limited. It could only display uppercase characters as 12 80 character lines or 48 20 character lines in four columns. It didn't even make use of a microprocessor. In 1978 they introduced the H19 terminal which offered a higher quality display with 23 80 character lines with upper and lower case and graphics characters and DEC VT52 compatibility. The keyboard featured 80 keys including 12 function keys and a numeric keypad. It was controlled by a Z80 microprocessor. At the same time, the trend in microcomputers was moving away from units with separate serial terminals and peripherals and moving to integrated units with main unit, keyboard display and floppy drives one example being the Radio Shack TRS-80. Leveraging the H19 terminal, Heathkit offered the H89 all-in-one computer, which was essentially an H8 computer and dual floppy drive integrated into an H19 terminal. At the same time, it was upgraded to use the Z80 CPU-based controller card that had previously been offered as an optional upgrade for the H8. So the system now had two Z80 2 MHz CPUs, one for the main processor and one for the terminal. It also came with 16K of RAM and could be expanded to 48K by plugging additional RAM chips onto the CPU board. It offered slots for expansion boards, but they were not compatible with the H8. The H89 came with one 100K 5.25 inch floppy drive. A less expensive model, the H88, was identical but shipped without a floppy drive and controller and included the interface for cassette tape storage. Like most Heath products, the H88 and H89 were sold as kits. They were also offered in factory assembled versions, the WH88 and WH89 respectively. The H89 was mostly backwards compatible with the H8 and supported Heathkit's HDOS operating system, CPM, and others such as UCSD Pascal. Heathkit offered a wide range of software applications such as utilities and language compilers, and additional software was available from third parties and user groups. Other models of the series were the Z89 and Z90, 
Heathkit was acquired by the Zenith Radio Company in 1979. The Z89 was a Zenith branded version of the H89, sold only assembled form and running CPM. The Z90 was a lower cost version that lacked a floppy drive, much like the H88. To give you some idea of the cost of hardware at the time, the Z67 external drive provided an 11 megabyte hard drive and an 8 inch floppy drive. My 1981 catalog lists it at a price of $5,800, equivalent to over $19,000 today. An updated model, the H89A, expanded the standard RAM to 48K, supporting up to 64K, offered anti-glare white or green CRTs, and came with three serial ports. It also included the hardware modifications needed to run standard CPM. A double density floppy disk controller was offered that stored 160 kilobytes versus the 100K of the standard drives. External floppies were supported by a new H37 dual floppy drive unit. This drive supported using single density 100K drives and dual density 160K, both hard sectored, or double density soft sectored floppies, which could store 360 kilobytes. The H89 computer was discontinued in 1983. By then, Heath had introduced their next generation of systems based on the H100, which could run either CPM or Heathkit's version of MS DOS. Later in the 1980s, they introduced IBM compatibles selling them up to the 1990s when they left the kit business. Today, the H8 and H89 are probably the most popular Heathkit computer systems among the retro computing community. Many people have systems that have been restored, and running applications under CPM or HDOS on these old systems can be a lot of fun. Systems and accessories can be found on sites like eBay, although prices have gone up dramatically in the last few years as interest has increased. There's an active community of websites and forums devoted to the H8 and H89 series. Manuals and software are available, and some users have even designed new circuit boards. In summary, these were the key features of the Heathkit H89 computer. An all-in-one desktop computer, offered from 1979 to 1985, available as a kit or pre-assembled, Two Zilog Z80A CPUs running at 2.048 MHz, one for the CPU board and one for the terminal. 16K of RAM expandable to 64K with optional memory cards. A boot ROM with monitor program. A 12-inch CRT monitor displaying 80 columns by 25 lines, upper and lowercase text, and simple block characters, but no graphics. A full-size keyboard with function keys and numeric keypad. Optional 5 and a quarter inch floppy drives, initially 100 kilobytes per disk and later up to 360 kilobytes. A cassette tape interface on non-floppy systems. Serial ports, optional parallel ports, and support for CPM and HDOS operating systems. As mentioned at the beginning, this is planned to be one of a series of YouTube videos on the Heathkit H89 with more videos to come that dive more deeply into the hardware and software. If you're interested in Heathkit or retro computers, you may want to purchase a copy of my book, Classic Heathkit Computers, Calculators, and Robots. It's a guide to Heathkit computers from the analog computers of the 1950s to the IBM PC compatibles of the 1990s. It includes coverage of calculators, 8- and 16-bit computers, the Hero line of robots, microprocessor trainers and peripherals, as well as software and tips on restoration and repair. For more details, see the link posted in the YouTube video description.